Good evening, Integrity Christian Center. Are we ready to pray? Those streaming with us, we welcome you. Thank you for joining us. Stand at home if you can or just get in the spirit of prayer. We're going to pray the house down. Amen. We're excited, Father. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for this day, Father. We thank you for Miracle Day. We thank you for the day that you have made, Father. We are rejoicing and we are glad in tonight, Father. We just lift up hands of praise. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Welcome in. Come on up to the altar. Let's fill the altar. Ha ha ha. Shokora la kaseke releke seke. Hamara la kane ne 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 ne. Yamara la kashokora la kaseke. Ha shone me releke de 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 de. Yapara la kaseke releke. Ha shene me releke. Ha seke releke. We thank you, Lord. You are the miracle worker. You keep your promises, Father. You watch over your word to perform it, Father. We thank you, Lord. We believe, Father. We ask for a stirring up of our heart tonight, Father. Ha se releke sheke. Ho shake us. Ha ha se ke releke. Fill this place with your presence. Ha ma ralaka so ko ralaka. We're hungry for you. Ha ma ralaka se ke releke releke. Ha sho ko ralaka se ke he 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 he. Ha raka se ke releke de 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 de. Ha mara la kasho kora la kaseke mara la kaseke he 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 sho kora la kaseke ha mara la kaseke releke sho kora la kahasake pe ha ne 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 ha para la kaseke he 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 ho shakara la ka ho releke he se ke releke releke ho shokora la kaseke releke hallelujah Ya hallelujah ho sheke releke seke hamara la kaseke releke sheke releke ho ra kaseke pereleke releke ha ra kaseke releke ha 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 we say that our steps are ordered by you father we are stretching we are growing ha ha shokora la kase ha seke releke we're increasing our capacity Hamara la kaseke, not only as individuals but as a church. Ha shokore le kese, kere le kese. Hamara la kaseke, he 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 he. Ha 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 ha. Ho re le kere le kese, kere le ke. Ha, we are confident in you, Father. We are thankful for the anointing that goes with us. Ha mara la kaseke, he 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 he. We're watching it break things off of our lives. Oh, we're watching it bring healing where it needs to be. We call everybody healed in Jesus' name. Every joint, every bone, every membrane. Every cell made right. Ha 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 shokora la kaseke ha mara la keseke releke ha shoko ho 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 ha mara la kaseke releke we speak with the authority of the holy spirit of god shokora la kaseke releke releke ha mara la ka shokora la ka releke ha 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 Hey, 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 we rejoice in our God who is well able. Ha ne me releke, sheke releke, ha mara la kase ke releke, ha 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 ha. Hey, 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 ya mara la kase ko ra la kase ke releke, ha shokora la kase. We claim victory now. We claim victory today. Hey, pe releke, sheke releke, ra la ka. 
We thank you, Father. We know that you are doing things that we cannot see. Ha ha shokora la ka seke releke. Hamara la ka shokora la ka seke. We walk by faith, not by sight. Shaka para la ka seke releke. Hamara la ka seke releke. May our faith, Father, be pleasing to you, Lord. Hamara la ka seke releke releke. You will look upon us and you will say, He is faithful, she is faithful. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your promises are yes and amen. If anyone's going to be blessed, it's going to be us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We put a draw, Father, on your kingdom. We put a draw on the abundance. It belongs to us. Ha ha. Ha 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 ha. We can't ask for everything that we need, and you will fill our needs, Father. We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. Ha ha. Hamara la ka shokora la ka seke releke. Hamara la ka shoko ho 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 ho. Ha ne me releke releke releke. What a great God. What a great God. Ha shokora la ka seke. We magnify you, Father. We call you holy. Ha reke 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 reke. Hamara la ka shokora la ka seke releke. Help us, Father, to think your thoughts. As we see in your word, Father. And we keep the word in our hearts. Ha 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 ha. And in our lips. Oh, speaking the word only. Be indisciplined, diligent to say what God says over our families, over our jobs, over our circumstances, over our trials. May God get all the glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's because of what you did. We walk in thankfulness, God. Thankfulness for what you've done. You are doing a mighty work in us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Nothing is too difficult for you. We call on the peace of God to, to, to dwell with us. Ha shokora la ka seke he he. Ha soko the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Ha mara la ka shokora la ka seke releke. Ha mara la ka sokora la ka seke. Ha ha. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I do not worry. Ha re pereleke. I know who my God is. Ha mereleke shoko. I know him and he knows me. Ha maralaka soko ralaka. He knows me by my name. Ha releke. Ha ha soko releke se he he he. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, shake, hey, 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 hey. Glory, glory, glory.
be to you, Father. We thank you, God. You are so good to us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. There's rejoicing in the house. There's victory. This is our victory weekend. Ha ha, this is our victory month. This is our victory year. Ha Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. My God is the best God. Oh, there's nobody like him. Ha ha ha. Hallelujah. Shokora la kase ke he he. Hamara la kase ke releke. In our weaknesses, we are strong because of him. Hamara la kase shokora la kase. We give you praise, Father. We thank you, Jesus. Hama shokora la kase ke releke. Hamara la kase shoko ho ho ho. Ha 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 ha. Hey, ha ha. Oh, Sheke, the generation of the upright shall be blessed. Ha ma ra la ka so ko ra la ka se ke. Hallelujah. Our lives are witnesses to those who don't know you, Father. We thank you, Jesus. Oh, ha ha. Thank you for using us every day. Ha ma ra la ka so ko ra la ka se ke re le ke. May the glory of the Lord be apparent to every single person that comes in contact with us. No matter where we are, Father. We surrender to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we claim that our lives are impacting those around us, Father. Oh, shaka para la case, ha seke, that you bring soul winning opportunities to our lives. Sakape, ha shokore leke seke releke releke, ha mara la case ke releke. Use us, Father. Use us, Father. Shoka para la case ke releke releke, ha mara la case ko. We give you glory. We give you glory, glory. Ha ha, shokore le kese. What a great God. Ha ha. Ho re kese ke he 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 he. Ha ma shokore la kase ke. Ha ma ra la kase ke. Have your way. Have your way tonight, Father. Ho shakara la ka. Fill our hearts. Fill this place. Anyone streaming, Father, we ask that the anointing of God be in that place. If they're streaming now or in a year from now, Father, we thank you that the anointing knows no time or place, Father. Oh, we give you praise. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. Ha shokora la kase ke releke. Ha 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 shokora la kase ke releke. Ha se ke releke. Ha 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 ha. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Ha shokora la kase ke. Ha mara la kase ke releke releke. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Shoka para la case, ha seke, ha seke, he seke, ha 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 ha. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise you, God.
Come on, lift your hands and sing. You are great. Forget about the day. Forget about everything that's been going on this week. Press in to the Lord. Press into His presence. Press in to be with Him. Press in to be with Him. Lord, we thank you that you flow by your spirit. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost remove every burden destroy every yoke we enter into your presence we thank you father god that in your presence there is fullness of joy and i thank you that the joy of the lord is our strength lord we were worshiping and singing about your strength tonight we receive it now we receive strength we receive father supernatural endowments Perform your promises in us. 
We lay claim to them by faith in the name of Jesus. I love you, Lord, and I bless you. I bless you, Jesus. I bless you, Jesus. I bless you, Jesus. Blessed be your name, holy name. I give honor and glory, a sacrifice of praise. I live to you in Jesus' name. My heart is full. It's full of the word, full of faith, full of what you said. My heart is full with a glad heart and in full assurance of my faith I give praise to you My needs are met My needs are met by the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost by the Word Life. The promises, my needs are met. Come on, begin to talk to the Lord about your needs being met. The Lord's meeting needs right now. My needs are met, my needs are met, my needs are met. My needs are met, my needs are met. Oh, the promises of God. They are alive in me, they are alive in me, they are alive in me. The Word is working. The Word is working. The Word is working. Working in me. You bring about a healing and a cure my release from sickness, from pain, from anything malfunctioning in our bodies. We receive healing power. Our heart is full of the Word. Our heart is full of the Word. Our needs are met. Our needs are met. Our needs are met by faith. We believe we receive everything we need those who need wisdom those who are seeking your answers I thank you that wisdom comes direction comes clarity comes they know what to do and when to do it and how to do it because the Holy Ghost leads and guides and moves and operates in them they're using their faith they're standing by faith they believe your word. They believe your word. They believe your word. And your word is working. Your word is working. Your word is working mightily. My needs are met. My needs are met. I have everything. He promised. My needs are met. My needs are met. I believe I receive everything He told me. The Word is working. Come on, talk to your body, talk to your mind, talk to your finances, talk to that area of your life. You need help, you need God's help. You need to gain God's help and assistance tonight. You need Him to minister to you tonight. Apply your faith for it right now. Apply your faith for it. Apply your faith for it. I receive it. I believe I receive it. I believe your promises. I believe your promise. 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 I believe 
everything you told me. I believe everything you said. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. I believe. I receive everything that you said to me. I believe. I receive everything that you said to me. I believe. I receive everything that you promised I believe I receive everything that you said to me my faith my faith has been released I put my faith on the line I put my faith on the line and now I declare today it's mine I believe I receive. Come on, release your faith right now. I believe I receive. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. I have it now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. It's mine. I have it now. I believe I receive. Come on. Let's give the Lord some praise. We celebrate you, Jesus. We celebrate you, Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. Glory to God. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. You're great. 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 You do miracles. You do miracles. to somebody near you. Come on, do it now. Grab the hand of somebody. Don't leave anybody by themselves. Nobody sitting there alone needs to be by themselves. Somebody make a move. Grab somebody by the hand in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you that every need in our life, in our family, in our marriage, in our finances, in our body, we call our needs met. We call it done in the holy name of Jesus. We say we are the blessed of the Lord. We are well provided for. 
We're taken care of by faith. God is our healer. He's our source. He's our wisdom. And we thank you, Father. We receive all these things and more in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Turn to five people and say, my needs are met because of Jesus. Tell them, my needs are met because of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you in the house of the Lord tonight. Praise God. Everybody say, my needs are met. Now, when you get seated and look up here at me, <laughs> discouragement will keep you out of faith. It will rip you off and keep you from stepping forward in faith. So you have to resist uh, discouragement the same way you would resist anything else that was trying to attack you. You know, fight back. Fight back. Do what it takes to have the joy of the Lord. Do what it takes to, you know, sing. You may not feel anything. Sing anyway. You may feel like you're burdened down and you're almost on overload. You feel like you got an elephant on your back. I sing to you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I magnify. Do something to fight against discouragement. Because once discouragement sets in, it completely hinders you from using your faith. And I just sensed I needed to say that to you today. Now, everybody, everybody I know has had those kind of battles where you've dealt with something and, and it can be discouraging. I get it. I understand that. But you have to fight against that discouragement because you need your faith working. You want to keep your faith working. Once you've applied your faith, don't, don't pull it back. Now, do you ever, does anybody remember back a few years ago, some of you attend faith school, some of you shouldn't, that don't should. Uh, and I'm not scolding you, I'm just saying you really should because you, you, you probably don't have as much going as you thought you could have or should have if you'd have got yourself built up in faith. But a few years back, a few years back, we talked about faith as a servant. Faith as a servant. And a lot of people call their servant back in. Sit down, relax, put your feet up. You keep, him, you keep old faith working. You work your faith day and night. You don't ever draw it back from the field until it has finished its assignment. Amen. So until you've got a full manifestation, you're not done. Thank God for partial manifestations. Thank God for a touch. It's not enough. We're going for the full manifestation, whether it's healing, finances, whatever it could be. You apply your faith and keep your faith on the line. You do not draw it back in. But see, if you, if you start letting discouragement settle in on you and you don't resist it, another word for you here. If you study in the book of Genesis, uh, when God made covenant to Abraham and Abraham brought sacrifices, there was the bullock and other things that were slain and uh, there was the pieces laid out. That's part of covenant meal, by the way. The, each party would walk between the pieces and, and you know, it was bloody. We're going to talk a, bit, a little bit more about communion tonight. It's a bloody deal. And uh, I'm not going to talk about this part, but really it applies. But when Abraham was making this covenant and had these sacrifices, uh, if I can say it this way, the, the buzzards came. And he literally had to drive the buzzards away so that his sacrifice would not be consumed by buzzards. A lot of you are letting your faith get consumed by buzzards. Some of those buzzards are named discouragement. I mean, I don't like pressure. I don't think you do either. But when you're under pressure, you, can't let, you cannot allow discouragement to cause you to say, Faith, come on back in here and take, your, take a seat. We're, we're not going for this after all. No, you, you drive it off the way you drive the birds off your sacrifice. The buzzards off. You're not messing with me. And other things as well. Amen. Do you receive that exhortation? Yes. Came in my spirit while we were up here worshiping and I wanted to obey the Lord. I sleep better at night when I obey the Lord. Yeah. Amen. I think you'll sleep better at night when I obey the Lord. So, <laughs> hey, it works, works all around for all of us, correct? Amen. 
Well, this is a full, awesome, powerful weekend. I've been so looking forward to this particular weekend and uh, celebrating 20 years. Amen. I keep saying it, but I want to keep reminding you. Um, you couldn't have done it without Pastor Brenda and me, but we couldn't have done it without you. So it's our party. It's our banquet. It's our celebration. Not just mine. It's ours. It's ours. And we, we've got some good things in store for this weekend. And uh, referring to that, I'm going to have Mr. Andrew, Andrew Madden, come up here, update us on some announcements, if you will, please, sir. And he'll get you updated on what all is happening around here today. Amen. Or this weekend, I should say, and, and beyond. Amen. All right. Good evening, everybody. Let's do some announcements. Um, before we start, um, I wanted to encourage you guys to um, really... Um, memorize this memory verse, um, and I challenge you to have it memorized by the end of May and be able to read without looking. I think it'd be good for all of us. So uh, let's start on the count of three. One, two, three. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And that's Hebrews 10, to 23. And the focus book for the month of May is Galatians. Go ahead and read that 10 times or more in addition to your daily Bible reading, and we'll get you a certificate. Amen. Amen. And then um, Sundays, closer than ever, uh, we'll be continuing next Sunday because of... A special guest that we're having. And the holiness factor, um, that's been good. So I encourage you to be prepared for tonight as we dig into Holy Communion a little deeper with Pastor Kenny. And yes, and Faith School, new series starting May 15th, this Sunday. Um, diligently developing faith for healing. I'm excited about this, as I'm sure all of you are. So I encourage you to make it out here at 8 a.m. All right, in 20 years of changed lives at Integrity Christian Center, uh, we'll be having a banquet this Sunday evening to celebrate that. And um, anyone in the Ministry of Helps, um, please see Anna at the information station after the service and confirm your starting date of Ministry of Helps uh, before you leave tonight. All right, and this Sunday is Pastor Ken Harbaum. I encourage everyone to invite at least one person. Um, so he's not preaching to our chairs, um, but be prepared for a good service. And then the following, well, no, two, two weeks after that, uh, Dr. Mark T. Barclay, he'll be joining us. Um, he always comes with a powerful word. So again, I encourage you to invite someone so that they can receive as well. And May birthdays, uh, Miss Karina's coming up, so make sure to wish her a happy birthday this Sunday. And that is all. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sir. Hallelujah. Grab your Bible. Turn to the book of Malachi, uh, chapter 2. Woo! Yeah, that threw you a curveball there with the chapter 2 part, huh? <laughs> Malachi, chapter 2. Thank you, Jesus. And I want to look at verse uh, 17, the final verse of that chapter. Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, it says, You have wearied the Lord with your words. Did you ever think maybe your words are wearing the Lord out? <laughs> That's a heavy verse, isn't it? Your words have wearied me, the Lord said. Uh, man, have you ever been worn out by a complainer? You ever been around somebody that whines and complains about every, anybody besides me ever had that experience? Oh, everybody. And you know how it kind of wears you down? It's like, would you play the, uh, this will date you, I apologize, but it's, would you please turn the record to the other side? <laughs> now, I, know, I know a number of you don't even know what a record is. It was a larger CD. 
Turn the record to the other side, man. There's got to be something working in life, right? So how many of us are wearying the Lord with our words? And let me read the rest of this verse. Watch this now. It said, you have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, wherein have we wearied him? You know, well, I didn't do it. It's everybody else that does that. Well, when you say everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them, or where is the God of judgment? In other words, people start whining about the fact, well, look at this person. They don't serve God as diligently as me and they don't have near the trouble I have. Pause, pause. That is not your discussion. You're going to get yourself in error and it will hurt your life. It will delay your breakthrough. So monitor, we're going to receive our tithes and offerings, but I want you to monitor your mouth. What are you saying? Are you cursing your own finances? Are you cursing your own income? Are you cursing your own increase? By complaining about, well, how come they get it? How come they did? How, stop. Stop. That's not your deal. That's not your deal. You're, the devil will always try to get you in some kind of a comparison trap. He doesn't tell you he's trapping you. He doesn't tell you he's cutting you off at the knees, so to speak. You know what I'm talking about? We're, eh. But he, that's exactly what he's doing. Don't let him do it. All right, now, uh uh-uh. Don't be complaining. We're going to the third chapter. <laughs> Malachi chapter 3. Do you know verses 8 through 12? No comment. Okay. We're going to preach on tithes and offerings tonight because we, we're having problems with getting in there. Do you know verses 8 through 12 where it talks about, well, a man robbed God, yet you've robbed me. When you tithe, he opens the windows of heaven, pours out blessings, you don't have room enough to receive. He rebukes the devourer for your sake. Do you know those verses? Yes. All right, good. And then verse 12 talks about being blessed. Would you please look at verse 13? Your words have been stout against me. Huh. See, I, I, when, when people tell me I tithe and nothing works, I give and nothing works, then we've got to start looking for, okay, there's something that's blowing a hole in the boat, and that's why the boat's sinking. Your words are stout against me, saith the Lord, yet you say, what have we spoken so much against thee? You have said it is vain to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinances? Or that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. How many know that is not the words that should be coming out of your mouth? In other words, I go to church, I tithe, look at me. This didn't work, this didn't work. Stop. Your own words not only will curse your your the fix, you know what I mean? The God fixing the situation, your words may have created the situation. So I want you to learn to speak what God says about you, what God says about your money. When you're presenting the holy tithes and offerings to the Lord, say that, Lord, these are your tithes and my offerings. I present them to you. I treat them holy. And I thank you the windows of heaven are are indeed open over my life. I don't care what I feel today. I don't care what my circumstances are telling me. Your word, your promises, the windows of heaven are open over my life. I live under an open heaven. And you're pouring out blessings. I don't have room enough to receive. Say these words with your mouth. And Satan, the devourer, has been rebuked for my sake. And according to verse 12, I'm the blessed of God. I'm blessed. I call myself blessed. I'm blessed coming in and blessed going out. But you've got to fix your words. Fix your words in Jesus' name. Do you receive that exhortation tonight? All right. Ushers, help me, please. And distribute the tithe and offering envelopes. I do want to encourage everyone to take one. If you're writing a check, make a check payable to Integrity Christian Center or ICC. You can also give by cash, of course, or by debit or credit card using the inside flap of the envelope. Also on your screen is information about text to give, giving by cash app, Venmo, and other (laughs) items. Also, there, and if you are streaming with us, you can go to integritytoday.org. That is our church website. You can hit the Give button. It takes you to a secure PayPal page. You can give that way. Or also, I believe on the, the uh, live stream screen, there should also be information about how you can use the text to give, Cash App, PayPal, Venmo, and so on. 
in Jesus' name. Ushers are coming now with the offering baskets. When you are ready to present the holy tithes and offerings to the Lord, please come forward and do so. Amen. Together. If you haven't come forward yet and still need to do so, you can do so as we pray. Heavenly Father, we present the holy tithes and offerings to you. We know that there in heaven, Jesus is alive. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that there he receives the tithes that we're presenting right now. They're in the hands of Jesus Christ. And he, as the great high priest, is speaking blessings upon our life. And we receive his blessings. We receive his blessings. We receive his increase upon us. We get our words in line with your words. We will say what you say. We will declare what you promised us. And we will have all of it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Take your seats, if you will. Grab your Bible. Turn to Ezekiel, please. Chapter 44. Ezekiel chapter 44. How many is benefiting from this series called The Holiness Factor? Are you learning some more things about the holy things of God? And I'm trying not to just belabor a point, you know, unnecessarily. But I do want to make sure we're clear on some things. And so that's why I'm kind of covering things. And, and a few of them I've gone two or three weeks on. Uh, I'll just be honest with you. I grew up in church, as you all know, and I don't say these things as a complaint or as a put down necessarily, but you know, I don't remember ever a sermon on, the, on Holy Communion. I don't remember anybody taking the time to teach us why we did this. Now, they serve communion, and, and, and they, I'm not even sure. I don't know. I, I was young, and so I can't, I can't say for sure. But I'm not even sure we did it once a month. I do remember at the church I grew up in. Um, in fact, I had one uh, before the church I pastored before that somebody donated. It was a beautiful communion uh, bench, and it, on, and on it was engraved, This Do in Remembrance of Me. We had one of those when I was growing up. Uh, when I pastored before, I had one of those. I think they're very cool. Um, and yet I never heard a sermon on communion or why we take communion or how holy it is. Uh, things I got into last week, you know, regarding Judas and his du dual covenant that he's going on with him. Nobody taught me that. Did anybody teach you that? Um, how about eating and drinking unworthily? I mean, you may have learned it here, but I mean, I didn't grow. I didn't. You, you did have somebody teaching you? That, that's awesome. I didn't. And so I'm just assuming this might be good information to know. It's in our Bible anyway. So we're a Bible church. We teach the Bible. But there are just so many things about so many things that I think go unsaid. And we just kind of, well, I'm, I think... 
I know something about it because we always do it. But I wanted to take a little extra time with it. And so that's why we're doing this portion of the holiness factor, talking about Holy Communion. We've been using a couple of different texts about the pastor's responsibility, the priest's responsibility to teach you about holy things. And so this is just kind of a good launching pad each week. I've done some from Leviticus, and now I'm using some from Ezekiel, chapter 44, verse 23. And they shall teach my people the difference um, between holy and profane. Seems to be a lot of confusion about that in many churches today. The, the, you know, some of the things I see or hear about, or, and I'm going, wow, they do that in church? They, they don't know the church is supposed to be holy. It's supposed to be holy. I know, I know of churches that have drinking and dancing for socializing, and so everybody gets sauced and may take the wrong husband or the wrong wife home. But we did it at church. Well, we know the difference. Do we not know the difference between what is holy and what is profane? Um, yeah. If I, if I told you all the things I know, all the things I've, I have seen, or all the things I've had to deal with, you'll know why we need this series on the holiness factor and cover this stuff. They shall teach my people the difference between holy and profane and cause them to discern. Cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. As we've been teaching this series, it should cause you to discern things more clearly and say, okay, wait a minute, that is a problem. Um, I have also in my lifetime been amazed at what Christian people watch on TV. And I've always thought, you didn't discern that's trash? You didn't pick up on the fact that... See, I don't want to regulate. I, 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 can't, I don't want to control your life. I'm not going to come over and watch, find out what you watch. I don't have time for that kind of nonsense. You're supposed to be able to discern. That's trash, man. What are we doing watching this stuff? And be willing to... You know, I said, oh, man, I'm really into this series. Yeah, but it's a trashy series. See, I'm preaching better than you're amening. I hope your amener will get fixed as we go along tonight. All right, let's get into this about communion. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, last week I gave you two of the four gospel sections that dealt with communion. All four of them do. I just picked out two that we could learn some things and dig into some things. But tonight I want to deal with what the Holy Spirit specifically, what the Lord Jesus really specifically ministered to the Apostle Paul because it said that he received it by revelation. He wasn't at the communion table that night with Jesus. But he received by revelation some things and then the Holy Spirit had him share those things with us. Something I want you to understand is that what we're reading over here in 1 Corinthians obviously was originally written to the church at Corinth, but it's for the entire body of Christ. You understand that? That's why we can read the book of Galatians and know that the Galatian church initially received these instructions, but they're for us too. The, the church at Ephesus initially received the book of Ephesians, but it's for us too. So true with all the epistles though they have different names like Corinthians and Philippians and so on. Now, the reason I brought up this about Corinth is Corinth was having some problems in the church. I hate problems in the church. But as long as there's people, you get to deal with stuff. And... Settle down now. Don't be pointing fingers at anybody. But not everybody's fixed. Do you know what I'm talking about right there? Not everybody's all the way fixed. They still got some issues. We got to work on that. We got to get your mouth in order. We got to get your attitude fixed. We've got to get whatever. Well, the church at Corinth had some moral issues. And the church at Corinth had a lot of jealousy and strife issues. Listen. 
the church at Corinth even had people going to court against other people in church. You talk about awkward in church. <laughs> Shake hands with somebody near you. Let them know you love them. I'm suing you, Bal. I'll just tell you right now. That's a tough, uh, tough ministry, a tough place to preach. Well, that was what was going on in Corinth. Keep all that in mind because everything we're going to deal with about communion means you got to deal with you in that kind of stuff. You don't get to be jealous about everybody else. Do you hear me? You do not get you do not have that luxury to be jealous, to be envious. You don't have the luxury of being in strife. You don't have the luxury of being in sin in any area. So holy communion points these things out. So the earlier chapters of this book of 1 Corinthians, Paul's dealing with some of this stuff. Then he comes to, okay, here's how we examine ourselves, fix ourselves at the communion table. So I wanted you to have at least that much in your thought life as we approach these verses here tonight. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I have received... Of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. See, I received it of the Lord. He didn't, he wasn't there. He received it of the Lord, which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in, he, in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now, we're, just a reminder of what we learned last week. Uh, the bread was part of every covenant meal, part of every covenant meal. And when they would take the bread, that bread always talked about, I'm giving you all of, of me there is, all my wealth, all my possessions, everything I have, everything I am. I break it and I give it to you as a token. It's, you know, there are, there are various types of tokens in holy covenants. I'm planning to do a little teaching on holy matrimony. Amen. Not the unholy mess. But holy matrimony. Amen. All right. When a couple stands in front of me. Now, I'm selective. I don't marry just anybody. I don't officiate a wedding. That's, you know, I don't officiate a wedding. I don't marry just anybody who wants to be married. In fact, we had to change our, I won't, because we're streaming. I won't get into all that. We had to change some things in our legalities here. Uh, I think I have talked about some of that before, but I'm learning that, some of this is better on private meetings. How's that? No offense to anybody streaming. That's just the way it is. But there are tokens, for example, at that wedding ceremony. They exchange vows. They're making a commitment. This isn't just talking, hey, I'll do this, you do that. Okay, thanks. Let's kiss and go. No, it's actually a vow. It's called a vow for a reason. They're making a covenant with one another. That's a pretty important thing. They're doing it in front of a, a holy man. They're doing it in front of holy people. They're doing it in front of a holy God. So they make their vows. Then they exchange rings. I always wear mine. I'm a frequent traveler, as you know, and I've seen some very sad things take place while waiting for a flight to board where I have seen men, just before they board, remove their wedding ring, slip it into a little plastic bag they carry with them, shove it down in their carry-on, and away they go for the week. Every time you look at your wedding ring, it should remind you of a covenant. You could get some amen and going in here if you... <laughs> it would just be amazing. But the point is, there are tokens of a covenant. So at a communion meal or a covenant meal, that breaking of bread was part of the tokens of a genuine comfort uh, uh, covenant symbolizing everything I am and everything I have is yours. Bread is, has been at times referred to as the staff of life. It sustains. It's, it's, it's you, you know... And so when Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, now I'm breaking it and handing it to you. I am your life. I will take care of you. I'm committed to you. 
This is what Jesus is telling us at communion. I'm totally committed to you. I mean, I'm willing to give everything I've got to make sure you're taken care of. Amen. Now, a good husband and father is going to do the same thing. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, we find the parallel between Jesus Christ as the head of the church and a husband taking care of his wife and then on into the sixth chapter of Ephesians taking care of the children, making sure the children are taken care of. Are you seeing anything I'm telling about here? I know we're talking about communion, but I kind of, I'm doing the parallels a little bit here, but I think you get it. Verse 23, one more time, please. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. So you got to take it, you have to eat it. That means you have to consume him. Not a lot of people are consumed with Jesus anymore. I want this church, Integrity Christian Center, to get consumed with Jesus. You just consume everything he is, everything he has. You know, when, the, when you see the parallel over in the book of Exodus about the Passover meal, they were told to eat the lamb. All of it. And use, those exact words were used, all of it. Eat all of it. Eat all of it. You, you can't, this is, not a, this is not, you know, where you go down with your tray like a cafeteria. I'll take that. No, nah, I don't want that. I don't like that. No, nah, I don't like that. Give me one of those. See, when it, when it comes to Jesus, you eat it all. You eat, you eat all of him there is. Well, I didn't want that part. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, but I'm not interested in that. Oh. It's part of the lamb. You eat all of it. So when we break the bread, we're to eat all of it. Am I making any sense? You, can, you get consumed with him. You fill up on Jesus. So he said, take, take it, eat it, because this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In other words, Jesus wants us to remember the price he paid for you. And he wants you to remember that he partook of communion the same night that he was betrayed. We, he wants you to re, understand that not only did he take communion and serve it to his disciples, but we are going to be doing this over and over and over and over again until we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So this isn't a one-time event. This is something we live doing, remembering the price that Jesus paid for us. The reason that is critical is if you become forgetful of how much you cost Jesus, you may get lured into your enemy's ploys and activities just like Judas did. So listen to me. Though we may receive communion once a month, that's generally our pattern. Sometimes we receive it extra for other occasions. That's generally our church pattern. You, you can receive communion at home. Right there, you know, at your kitchen table or on your couch in the living room or in your bedroom or wherever you don't want to do it. You can receive Holy Communion too at your own home. Either with your whole family or a husband and wife or if you're a, a single, just, just you and Jesus. And I'd recommend that you do. I would recommend that you do as often as you feel you need to. Many ministers receive communion um, before they minister, before they go out to minister. They take a moment just to recognize, I'm called by your name. I'm washed in your blood. Uh, this is your assignment. This is not my assignment for my life. This is your assignment for my life. And I humble myself before you. Does that make sense? I humble myself to receive from you what you have for me today. So doing it over and over again, though, is not a religious ritual. Right? It's a lifestyle. Go back to the wedding. When the ring went on my finger, it wasn't the end when we had that part of the ceremony. Okay, I've already done that. I can take my ring back off. No, it's what I wear everywhere I go, everywhere I am. That's, you know. Now, pause, just because I don't want somebody to be confused. I've known men that took them off because of the, the mechanical stuff they worked on so that their ring did not get caught on the mechanisms and they put it back on when they were done with work. I get that. I totally understand that. No problem. No problem. doesn't mean I'm abandoning my wife. I'm going to work today. <laughs> I get that. Sometimes they work around different kind of uh, machinery or something that has a 
you know, high-powered magnets that, you know, they can pull your hand into something. And so I get that. I understand that. Um, but you understand this is, I'm committed when I'm asleep, when I'm awake, in town, out of town, daytime, nighttime. I'm committed to Jesus and Jesus is committed to me. So every time I receive communion, I'm doing it so that I don't forget I belong to him. It's not just a ritual because other religions have rituals that get nothing, do nothing. So it's, it's so much more than a ritual. It's remembering the price that was paid for us. Amen. It's a continual reminder also that we have a covenant, and this covenant is built on promises that he made to us. The covenant is based on promises that he made to us. Now, I've taught you a lot about promises. I've told you some of my stories in my own life with promises. I raised my kids to understand that if I ever used the phrase, I promise, that I was bound to it, that I was determined I would take care of whatever I said that I would do when I made a promise. You learn over time to be very cautious about your promises. Now, the closer we get to the rapture, uh, the more I've been examining what promises have I made that I didn't keep yet. I believe in keeping promises. I don't have much confidence in people that won't keep their promises. And I don't want to be a man who doesn't. So I do my best to always examine myself to see if I'm keeping them. Well, when I receive communion, I recognize that Jesus made promises. And I've made them to him. Now, I have personal things I won't get into tonight. I have some of these things shared with you before. I've shared some. But there are certain things in my life I made a commitment, some of them when I was a boy. I'm 61 years old. I'm not a boy anymore. And I've never gone back on those commitments. Things I would or wouldn't do. Things musically I would or wouldn't do. It was a vow I made. I made a promise. I cannot renege on my promise. Not when I go before the Lord putting my faith on his promise or receive communion as a reminder of his promise and my covenant with him, well, then I have to take a look at me and what have I said to the Lord? What did I say I'd do? What did I say I would not do? What commitment did I make? Let me give you one. I'll give you one of mine real quick. I don't know when this was. Maybe in my teens. Um, and I knew ministry was my calling. It's not my job. Now, this is a lot of work to, to be a minister, I'll just be honest with you. But it's my calling. That doesn't make it easier because you're called. It just, I know that it's, it's not like I, I filled out a job app. Eh, I could be a mailman, I could be a preacher, I could, you know, that really wasn't the case. I knew what I was called to do. But it used to bug me when I would see a minister that you could tell prepared very little for a particular service. Maybe... It was their midweek, for example. Now, this is technically our weeknight service, our Friday night service, you know. So I made a vow very young in life that I would never waste a service. That I would put as much into each service that I would minister for the rest of my life. I would dig deep. I would have, you know, to the best of my ability, I'd be anointed. I'd be ready to minister I wouldn't come in there and just toss a few things around. I didn't really have time. Haven't read my Bible in a month. I don't even know who Jesus is anymore. Here's a sermon. Uh, I've seen so much of that. It just nauseated me. Just as a young man. So I, so I vowed, Lord, I'll never waste a service. The other thing I recognized early in life, because you deal with people, you deal with people's problems. And there will be people in the services they need answers from heaven they don't need somebody that didn't pay a price to be in that pulpit for that service not their whole life's work but i'm talking about for that do you, will you pay a price for that service this one right here so i made a commitment i would never waste a service that every service we deal with life and death now that's what i did i didn't tell i can't do that with anybody else nobody else can 
I can't push that off on somebody else is what I'm trying to say. But I pushed it off on me. So when I say to the Lord, I'm standing on your promises, I have to remember mine to him. We're tithers. We, I, I, you know, my wife and I made vows like that 40-something years ago. We're tithers. We're givers. We try to be very generous people, not stingy people. Um, I'm not a hard-hearted person. I'm a little bit thicker skinned than I used to be, but I'm not a hard-hearted person. We talked about compassion just this last Sunday. I have compassion for people. Amen. I'm not a pushover, but I have compassion for people. How many understand what I'm talking about? So I made some things where my life was because communion is a covenant. It's just like at a, at a, uh, at a wedding, it's not just the husband that makes the vows and the pledges. It's not just the wife. It's not a one-sided event. It's, so I'm receiving everything he has when I partake of that bread, every, everything he is, his wealth, his provision. But I'm also presenting to him, Lord, you can call on me. You can call on me, and I'll do something. You can call on me, and I'll deal with that. I'm, I'm as much yours as you are mine. How many getting anything I'm saying to you here? So it's a covenant. Communion is a powerful thing. It's such a precious and holy thing. All right, keep reading with me now. Let's move into verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Hmm. In the Greek, when it comes to the word new or new covenant, it makes it very clear that we're talking about something that has never happened before. You, there's nothing like this anywhere else. No religion has, no other religion has this. This is a covenant that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, makes with you personally. Can't find this anywhere else. It's a new covenant. The word new obviously means brown, brand new, but it also means never before known or never known before. A covenant that has never been known before. There's never been anything like this new covenant. It's nothing like it anywhere. So when we're receiving communion, we understand there's nothing like this anywhere. Jesus shed his blood to give me new life. Jesus shed his blood to wash away all the sins I've ever committed. Amen. How many are glad that you've had all your sins washed away because of his blood? How many is glad he's been merciful towards you? Maybe you ought to be a little more merciful. Remember that story about those without sin cast the first stone? We could say it another way. Those who've never sinned? Yeah, all right. The ones who never made a mistake? Well, okay. Well, you, you're back. I mean, you're pitching. You're first. Let's see what you got. No, everybody has to say, Lord, I thank you that you've washed me from my sins. I thank you that you have cleansed me from all unrighteousness by the precious blood of Jesus. Now notice the word in here. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, verse 25. This do as oft as you drink it. Well, obviously that word means as often, but it's interesting when you study it out, it means as many times as necessary. As often as you drink of this cup, as, as many times as necessary. See, Maybe you're dealing with something in your life. Maybe you've had a bad attitude about something. Maybe you have not wanting, wanted to conform your will to his will. I'm sure that's never happened. <laughs> Where he said, this is what I want you to do, and I don't want to do that. Amen. And it's not always moved to China. Sometimes it's, it, it's walk in love with that person right there. Yeah. Huh? Some people are stinkers. My wife and my granddaughter were out horseback riding. The horse my, my wife had was named Tinker. And uh, I was riding a four-wheeler while they were out riding, and, you know, kind of coming up behind them, making sure everything was good from the, my side of the, the deal. Well, Tinker was a stinker. That's all I can tell you about that horse. Well, I've known some believers that may have been named Tinker, but they were stinkers. And, and the Lord says you need to walk in love with them. The Lord says you need to, you know, uh, reach out, be a blessing. And your will is not always to do that. 
but you conform your will. Your will may not always be to forgive people, but he'll always draw on you to do that. He will never let you off the hook with that, by the way. There's not one time he'll say, yeah, I understand. I think he's a jerk too. <laughs> Aren't you glad? <laughs> so you'll have to conform my will to his will. So that may mean that there's several times I receive communion as many times as necessary. There's times I receive, all right, Lord, I'm coming to you on this. I know we already did this, Lord, but I'm doing it again. I want to get my heart right with this. I want to do what you want me to do. I want this to work. I want to be right with you. So I receive communion again as many times as necessary. How many are getting this? This is a good thing. This is a good thing. So Jesus is telling us that we'll have to drink this covenant cup in remembrance of him over and over again, just like we partake of the bread over and over and over again. It's a long-term commitment. It's not a one-time thing. Um, you know, you don't get married every day, but the commitment from the day you got married is meant to last your lifetime. It's meant to last your lifetime. All right. Let's look now at verse uh, 26. Verse 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Now notice, there's two things there. When I'm receiving communion, I'm not only acknowledging the price that he paid through his death, the stripes he took on his back, the blood that was shed, I'm not only acknowledging that, I'm also acknowledging that he's coming again. You do show forth the Lord's death till he come. So in other words, I'm also recognizing when I receive communion, the Lord is coming. And I'm going to live accordingly. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. And I remember as a kid, if we had company coming, it didn't seem like it happened very often, but boy, if you had company coming, everything was spick and span. That's what my mom always said. It's spick and span. We want this house spick and span. Want you spick and span? Maybe my desire was to run down the street and ride bikes and pop wheelies and, you know, chase lizards or whatever. I grew up in the desert, so we did that kind of stuff. Whatever. But you better be here because we got company coming. We got, we got company coming. Well, every time I receive communion, I'm, I'm also not only remembering what he's done for me, he's coming. I got to live, man, ready. I got to live spick and span. Right? You get it? I got to live right. He's coming. This could be the very day. Jesus is coming. So communion is also a reminder that the rapture is about to take place. So as often as you do it, remember that the rapture is soon to take place. But as we go on now, as we enter verse 27, we understand that as we take communion, we are not to do it unworthily. Now, the word is unworthily, not unworthy. Unworthy means you're, not, you're just never worthy to do that. Well, without Jesus' salvation, no person would ever be worthy. The word unworthily, which is what the verses actually say, means to do something in an, a manner that... Um, you're disqualified from doing it. You, you're, 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 the manner you've chosen to do this, you're actually disqualified from coming to the covenant table. So let's look at this verse, please. Are you learning anything? Yeah. I'm not just wasting your time tonight, right? You, are you getting this? Yeah. Verse 26 says this. Uh, I'm going to read 26 and then hit, hit right into 27. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, or because of this, Whosoever shall eat this bread or drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Be guilty of the body and, bl and blood of the Lord. First of all, let me define unworthily. The word unworthily in the Greek means to be unfit. Unfit. But here's an interesting definition. It means not equal to the task. Not equal to the task. Judas was not equal to the task because he'd already been out making covenant with Jesus' enemies. And I want you to always examine your life. Do you, is there anything in your life where you've made a covenant with Jesus' enemies? Do you want what he said not to want? Do you love what he said not to love? 
Don't make a covenant with it. Do not make a covenant with it in the name of Jesus. So, in other words, there are, there are some who come to the Lord's table unfit to take Holy Communion. That's why we take time to examine ourselves. So let's read 27 again. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread or drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty. Wow. In other words, there is a judgment for it. Just like there's a pronouncement of co in court whether somebody is, is found guilty or whether someone is found not guilty, innocent. Guilty means that you're liable. Guilty means you're indicted. Guilty means you're charged. There is something that goes to work in you. For example, if you're in court and you're found guilty of a crime, there will have to be some kind of payment made. And that payment may be payment financially. You know, maybe, you know, you're ordered to pay X amount of thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. And jail time. Well, if, you know, most cases when you're found guilty, uh, they're cuffing you there. You're hauled off, you know. You're waving at your family behind you. You've been found guilty in a court. It's no laughing matter. It's no lightweight thing. And you're hauled off to a jail cell. Well, you understand that? Well, okay. So I'm eating or drinking communion unworthily, and I'm found guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. I am unfit to do this. I've got covenants elsewhere. I didn't repent of it. I took this lightly. I didn't treat this as holy. Now, just like you would be handcuffed and hauled off to a jail cell, the enemy recognizes very quickly that you are in a breach of covenant. And that begins to operate in you. You're going to find out about it. It begins to affect people physically. It begins to affect people mentally. It begins to affect people financially. And many times people can't pinpoint, okay, what is it? What is it? Well, pause. Tithes and offering is holy, correct? So if I'm not tithing, what am I doing? Violating a covenant. So then what? Well, the devourer now does have access to me. So always look for whatever doors you've opened. That's the first thing. Don't let the devil beat you up, but you automatically look and say, okay, is there something I'm not doing? Have I violated something? Always check there. Am I not tithing? No wonder the devourer is coming after me. Okay. But if that's not the case, don't let the devil beat you up on it. But what about communion? See, we're, we're not finished with our verses here. I did this knowing that I am living in violation to the word of God. Brother Hagin said one time he was out on the road preaching. And, uh, you know, when you're a traveling minister, now back in the day, not everybody knows this, but back in the day, um, we'd have week-long meetings, two-week meetings, three-weeks meetings. How many of you remember those days where you, you may have what we would call a revival meeting? It'd last three weeks, four weeks. Not uncommon. I mean, honestly, when I started traveling, um, it wasn't quite like that. I did do some Sunday to Sunday events at churches. And then I'd do Sunday to Wednesday or Sunday to Thursday. Uh, pick up another church for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, maybe into the next week. So that was even not uncommon 20-something, 20 25 years ago uh, when I was traveling. It wasn't as long of meetings. But I say that to say, you know, nowadays we have a guest speaker for one service. And wow. It's a lot of stress we've got going on. Yeah, well, you should have been in the revival meetings where we had to have ministry of helps taking care of things night after night after night for weeks. I say that to say that Brother Hagin's in this revival meeting that's gone for several weeks. When, you, when you're the guest speaker, you don't know all these people. You may get introduced to them or something. They come up and talk to you for a minute. You may remember this one's Mark and this one's Tom or this one's George or whatever. But you don't, you don't know the people. Uh, you don't know their commitment to the church, the things of God per se, unless the Lord reveals something to you or something occurs. Well, one night, uh, 
Brother Hagin was at the pastor's home, and a knock came on the door. It was a man that Brother Hagin recognized as attending the meeting. He's in every service. And um, he doesn't know all the details uh, until later, but I'm going to give you a couple details. The man had just started coming to the church about three or four months before. He had not yet joined the church. He hadn't become a member of the church, but he was attending regularly. So now he showed up to ask that Brother Hagen and this pastor would pray with him that night. Let me tell you what he wanted to pray for. He, had, in church, had cast his eyes upon this other woman who was married. Pray the Lord will give me his wife. I'm not going to pray with you. You know how many Bible verses we're going to violate? You, you know how much error you're in? Yeah. See, people do dumb things. Now, a guy like that who wants somebody else's wife is going to eat and drink unworthily. He's going to be guilty of the body. He's going to have to repent of some mess in his heart and mind and life. How many am I helping here today? You with me now? Guilty. You've been charged. The, you, the devil knows you're charged. You've been indicted. You sat at the covenant meal and you did it unworthily. In the Greek, you see that someone who's guilty is a person to be held responsible for a wrong action, a wrong behavior, or a wrong motive. Sometimes it's not outward actions that's going on in, life, in the lives of people. Sometimes it's their motive. I just want to be king of the hill. I just want to be the main person here. I just want to be, I just want to be, pause. What, if that's your motivation and Jesus didn't present you in that position, most people that actually have a leadership position wouldn't mind somebody else doing it. Because there's a lot of responsibility. So when you've got a wrong motive, you'll envy somebody else's spot or how come they, and then you'll be very sensitive like it's your baby. Every once in a while I have to deal with the leadership team. This is not your baby. Say it another way. You serve at the pleasure of the pastor. Knock it off. Stop your little attitude. But motives get involved. Now I'm bringing my motive, my wrong motive, my bad attitude to the communion table. How many is getting something and we think, maybe I ought to stop and pause a few more times and meditate on where my heart is before I start grabbing that cracker and grabbing that juice cup? Amen. 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 All right, let's go a little further. Verse 28. But let a man examine himself. Most people are masters at examining. Others. <laughs> Not themselves, but others. They notice every flaw the other person has. Every, everything they should do better, could do better, why don't you do it better? People master examining until it comes to them. I don't see anything wrong. <laughs> but that's not what it said. It said you examine you. Amen. And I'm going to deal with that word examine in a minute. It says, but let a man, a woman, a person, a human... Let a person examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Once you've examined yourself and you've repented, you can now eat and drink without doing it unworthily. But you have to pause and examine yourself. Now, here's the interesting thing. The word examine here means to test or inspect. I would not wait to test or inspect yourself until once a month when we receive communion. You may have to test and inspect yourself throughout the day. Each, uh, seriously. Not, I'm talk, not talking about to condemnation or to get depressed over I'm just an awful person. You know, a, ba a bad thought went across my mind about somebody and I just like to punch him right in the nose. <laughs> I'm no good. I'm no good. Well, I'll tell you what you do when you have that bad thought. You cast it down to the Lord. And you got to also discern whether or not that was your bad thought. Or the devil, you know, shooting a fiery dart past you. Because you know it's yours when you meditate on it and stick with it for a while. And you can't sleep. I haven't slept for hours. I'm just beating the 
tar out of these people, man, in my mind. <laughs> and I just can't rest. Yeah, no joke. So you got to repent of that. Got to repent of that. The word examine means to test or inspect. It means to scrutinize. It means to examine the quality or sincerity of a thing. Examine the quality or sincerity of a thing. Um, just as time has gone on, just things of my personal interest. I've, I've been interested in some Western art, for example. There's different levels of prints, and then there's the original. Um, things have value based on how rare they are, um, who the artist is, and so forth. So you kind of examine it. I've noticed a lot of airports have little art sections, you know, so there's times when I'm walking, you know, I'll stop and look at stuff. And I'll be honest with you, maybe I'm not, a, I would not, maybe I just need to take an art appreciation class because most stuff people say is art, I don't appreciate. <laughs> I, I don't appreciate that at all. That's the dumbest thing in the world. I, I have little grandchildren that could make something and it would be 10 times better than that and they're selling that for $1,800. You know, a little sticker in the airport, you know, 1800, contact us at this website. Are you nuts? All of us should become artists if we can make that kind of money on junk like that, you know? So I know I don't appreciate some things. But again, uh, I, I've been interested in coins and knowing the value, knowing if it's legit. Right? Okay. Well, this word examine actually comes from that. At the time that Paul wrote this, this word examine illustrated testing uh, for uh, the real versus the counterfeit coins of the day. Because even in those days, there were counterfeiters. It wasn't legit. So coins that people may be using and taking to the market, uh, a merchant would have to examine the coin, examine it, test it, scrutinize it, because if you're just taking junk, you've lost your money. The goods went out the door, but you've lost your money on this junk. So when I'm scrutinizing myself, I'm, I'm wanting to see, okay, am I real or am I a counterfeit? Am I a fake Christian? Am I saying I serve Jesus and never even think about him until next Sunday when, I, when the only thought I have is, am I going to church or not? Somebody say amen now. Come on. So that's what that uh, word examine came from, a business, business owner examining, just like they do today. You know, you hand over a $100 bill, the, the, the five places in America that still take cash. You hand over, let's say, a $100 bill. Man, they've got a pen out. They're holding things up to the light. They just want to make sure that's a legit bill. They don't want to, you know, take fake Monopoly money that somebody made in their back bedroom or something. They, so that's what, we, that's what that word means. You scrutinize yourself. You check the sincerity of your life. You check the sincerity of your heart for how you serve the Lord. It's also used to describe the process of testing an individual's character to see whether they are qualified for public office. That's what the word examine means. You know, a lot of people just vote for people. Maybe you should test their character. See, character matters. Are you listening to me? Well, your character matters too. Your character matters. And so by examining ourselves, we know whether or not we need to repent before we receive communion or, or whether or not, Lord, I, I genuinely feel I'm, I'm serving you correctly and I'm, I've got nothing hidden away. And there's nothing, that, you know. Get your own flashlight out and examine yourself. Don't wait for the Lord to send somebody, all right, here's what we're going to fix. This is what the Lord told me to tell you. Man, it's always better to examine you and fix you. It's a whole lot better lifestyle. Amen. So in the context of receiving Holy Communion, it means you examine yourself to see if you're in a state of genuine covenant. This is a covenant meal. Am I in genuine covenant or am I a pretender? Am I really chasing the world and... Remember Demas forsook Paul, the apostle, because he loved the world. Here he's working with the man of God, all these 
powerful things in Paul's life and ministry that's taken place, but he fell in love with the world in the process. He was a dual covenant guy and chased the world. Paul went on to say, Demas has forsaken me. Have you forsaken the Lord? I'm not saying you did. I'm asking you to take examination. I'm trying to wrap up here. I'm hoping I'm making this worth your being here tonight. Verse 29, let a man examine himself. I'm sorry, verse 28. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. In other words, you're partaking in judgment upon yourself. The gavel's coming down. You partook in something unworthily, and now you're being charged. Judgment came. Damnation came. The phrase not discerning in this verse indicates someone who lacks discernment, who does not appreciate and who does not rightly value the sacrificial covenant of Jesus Christ. They take it lightly. It's no big deal. Don't ever, don't ever approach the communion table with that attitude. Now, know this. All covenants have blessings and curses. All. All. All covenants have blessings and cursing. Curses, including the communion table. So ask yourself, am I cursing myself? Because I have a covenant here and a covenant there. I don't really serve Jesus genuinely. I'm a, I'm a faker. Verse 30. For this cause, because they ate and drank damnation to themselves, because they didn't repent, they found stuff. Well, maybe they didn't examine themselves at all, but if they did, they found stuff and didn't, didn't fix it. They didn't repent. They ate and drank damnation to themselves. Verse 30, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep or die prematurely. I don't want to die prematurely. I want to live out my years. Amen. Um, first of all, I want to live. I don't want to die. I want to live. I want to live out my years, number one. Number two, I feel like my wife needs me to. My kids need me to. My grandkids need me to. And over the process of years, you know, maybe great-grandkids. Be nice if I just kept living and was an example and a man of God. But I feel like you need me to. Others in the body of Christ need me to. So I don't want to goof this up and die prematurely. This is not a joke. It's not an added verse. Mm-hmm, thought I'd throw that in. This is critical. People die prematurely because of how they deal with the covenant they have with Jesus. Now, first of all, he said, for this cause many are weak. The word weak is a wide, in the Greek, it's a wide range of infirmities and illnesses. It's an all-encompassing term that embraces all forms of sickness, disease, and weaknesses. It also means to be financially poor. I mean, there's something wrong if you're at the same level financially 30, 40 years later that you've never busted out with your faith. I'd check you. I'd check to see if there was something in my life that's not right. It means to be financially poor. It means something that is very fragile and requires extreme, extreme care. You, ever, you know that phrase, with some people it feels like you have to walk on eggshells? Because you know if you actually walked on eggshells, they would crack. They would, they would crush. Um, first of all, don't be that type of person. But there are those types of people that are so weak emotionally, so weak mentally, so weak whatever. They're difficult to deal with because, man, you, if your eyes blink at the wrong time in their mind, you've somehow violated them. I'm serious, man. If, you know. um, but this is referring to people who are like that, but who are physically so fragile the devil has just played, you know, or, or, or worked havoc in their life. That's not the plan of God. The word sickly means to be in bad health, to possess a weak or broken condition, a person so weak and sick that they have become critically ill or an invalid. Pause. I am not telling you that every person who fights some kind of physical battle in their body somehow violated communion. That may not be the case at all. I'm just giving you the fact from this teaching that you should always examine yourself because you don't want to have this judgment come upon you. 
It's one thing to have the devil attack your life. It's another thing to have judgment or damnation come on you because of how you live that you don't walk right with God. Do you know the difference? So don't just say, I bet they received communion wrong. I bet they did it unworthily. How do you know? Go back to the examine you. <laughs> Stick with that line. It's, just focus on that line. Weak and sickly among you, many sleep or die prematurely. Last verse, verse 31. For if you would judge, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Man, that's got to be a verse you've got to work on. It's so easy to point out, like I said earlier, point out everybody else's flaws, imperfections, what you think about them. You got your hands full with you. You got your hands full with you. Work on you. He said judge yourself so that you're not judged or found guilty or have damnation come on you. Judge yourself. I judge myself. My attitude's wrong. My motive was wrong. My thinking was wrong. My words were wrong. Does that make sense to you? Did you get anything out of this? You better stand because I'll go another two hours thinking that you wanted it. <laughs> and if you're going to keep being slow about getting up, that's what I'm going to do. <coughs> you know, people are casting their Bibles aside now to jump up. No, we're ready to go home. Did you get anything out of that? How many think you understand communion a little bit more, a little better than you did before? Good, good. Father, we thank you for a great time we've had in your house. This has been so awesome to be with your people, to minister the word of life, to be fed spiritually. We thank you, Father God, that we are your people and we do want to be the genuine article. We don't want to be fakes, frauds. We don't, we don't want to have a covenant with the world and a covenant with Jesus. So we take time continually to examine ourselves to put ourselves under the spotlight, so to speak, of the word of God so that we see if there's an area we need to adjust or fix or repent, we're going to do it. We're going to do it speedily. We're not going to let stuff stay in our lives. We're not going to let things fester. But instead, in the name of Jesus, we're going to live pure and holy the way you said to live. Now, Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over your people. I thank you that the hand of the Lord is upon us for good. The angels surround about us and keep us safe. And in our pathway, there is life and no death. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. Don't miss this weekend. It's going to be powerful. New series in faith school starts at 8 o'clock Sunday morning. Pastor Ken Harbaum, they're flying in from Ohio. He's leaving his church, uh, his ministry there to be with us to celebrate 20 years. I know him. He's going to have a great word for us Sunday. Then we have the banquet. Ken will be there uh, as well, He'll speak just for a few minutes uh, Sunday night at the banquet. And then we have all sorts of other things we've got going. It's going to be a party. It's going to be a really good time. So uh, I love you, and we'll see you this weekend. See you Sunday. Call you blessed.